Paul Wren was the strongest man in the world according to the Guinness Book of World Records. Is that right? Am I saying that right? If I were lifting you and say that he wrote that. Power, power. A magazine wrote that. He was the strongest man in the world. Uh, he won the world title, heavyweight title, in 1981 in Calcutta, India. And um, he's uh, squatted the 975 pounds. Is that right? I can't do that. Uh, 975 pounds. Um, he's deadlifted. 855 pounds, um, and he's bench pressed, your biggest bench press, that was your weakest, yeah, 555, 555 but his bench press, he says is his weakest lift, I can't lift that much myself personally, um, but he's done a lot of things here over the years, he's been here with me a number of times, have you been to Elm Grove more than any church? Probably just so. Yeah, yeah, he, he pushed a bus up 32 Highway one time, uh, pushed a big, uh, Big bus up 32. He pulled a truck with it. It was 78 kids in it up 32 highway with his teeth. <sighs> He's done a lot of things. Been on That's Incredible, uh, Wide World of Sports. Done a, it's just been on a lot of things. He's a heavyweight lifter, but he loves Jesus Christ. He's a graduate of Tennessee Temple Schools in Chattanooga, Tennessee, with a master's degree and a bachelor's degree, right? And um, just got back from the Philippines where, how many? 29,000 people saved. 29,000. He's a great guy. I'm going to have him come on up here and talk to you a little bit. He's going to do a few things before he preaches to us. Well, first of all, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be back here at M. Grove Baptist Church. Now, I understand there are actually people here who have never seen me before. Uh, I'm just curious, how many of you have not seen me before? My goodness, a bunch of you. All right. Well, this is me. <laughs> and uh, your pastor is a dear friend. Um, you know, he was at Tennessee Temple till he f fell off that roof and... Uh, uh, tried to commit suicide or something, got, you know, got hurt and had to drop out. But uh, so we uh, are kindred spirits. We we're both prejudiced. We think everybody needs Jesus. But uh, I told the uh, the kids in children's church, and by the way, I survived that. <laughs> you think it's something to laugh about, you ought to try it sometime. But uh, uh, anyway, I told them that when I was a young man, I realized that God had blessed me with the ability to develop a lot of strength. Now, don't get me wrong, I had to train, had to work out, practice. But it just came. And I yielded it to the Lord. And I'm amazed what the Lord has done. I've been able to travel all over the world, preach the gospel. I guarantee I'm the only Baptist preacher you've ever seen that's preached the gospel in Red Square in Russia. And I did. Almost got arrested, but I did it. So, uh, uh, you know, the Lord is good. But what I want to get across to you, and this really isn't part of the message, when you get saved, God gives you abilities. The Bible calls them spiritual gifts. And then you have talents that you were born with. Give those to the Lord. Surrender them to him. And you'll be amazed what God can do. You know, I'm just a, a guy from North Carolina. A little place called Burlington. A lot of you probably never even heard of it. But the Lord accomplishes great 
things. Now, I'm going to do a couple of quick things this morning because uh, I know how Baptist people think on Sunday morning. When it gets time to get out of here, you want to get. So uh, we're just going to do a couple of things. I have to get these uh, chairs here. My first feat of strength. <laughs> uh, let's see. Some of you folks over here temporarily might want to adjust your seating because that pulpit's going to be in the way there. And uh, I was pleased about one thing. Since I got old, I had to get me a large print Bible. And it's a little bigger than most, but I noticed Pastor Siva has one too. So, okay. All right. I have a couple of boards here with me that I am bracing on the back of these two chairs. And the first thing I plan to do is to break the boards. The kids and the young people that are here, old folks are smarter, but the kids, young folks, don't go home and try what you see me do. Uh, I'd hate for a pastor to call me later and say, uh, one of my folks got hurt doing, uh, trying to do what you did. Now, I have with me a nail. I have a nail, I have a board, but no hammer. Only a pocket handkerchief that I have folded. Gonna put the head of the nail there in my hand. And I'll show you how to drive a nail with only your hand. And it looks something kind of like that. Now, do you have a guy here you think has a, a nice punch? Yeah. Drake, he, he, he's the guy's eyes are getting big. Come on up here, sir. Now, I've been accused of promoting violence. I don't believe in it. I'm a peaceful power lifter. Uh, but when I weighed 340 and 350 pounds, I had a big stomach. I'd meet people and say, that guy's fat. So I started incorporating into my demonstrations things that featured my most predominant muscle. That's this one. And one of the things I do, I let somebody who thinks they're a bad dude ball up their fist and give me their very best hard as they want to, one punch in the stomach. You won't even get in trouble for that. Isn't that great? So, now, I do a lot of prison and jail ministry, and uh, some of those guys are a little bloodthirsty, so I, I've kind of set a rule. Don't miss the stomach. Because believe it or not, I was in a jail in Birmingham, Alabama one time, and I told this guy, I said, give me your best shot. Patted my stomach like that. The guy reared back, hit me square in the chest. If they miss the stomach, I have a reflex action 
this arm just kind of straightens out, but surely a guy this caliber ought to be able to hit a target this big without missing. Okay. Yeah, right here. Just as hard as I can. Hard as you want to. All right. Hey, not bad. Good job. Thank you, man. I think it will. Okay, I would like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 27. Now tonight, I'm going to let a big guy jump on my stomach. And that'll be tonight, probably pick up a guy with my head right here. Now, I'm telling you what I'm going to do tonight because I have a reason. Some of you know folks that are not here this morning. Get on the phone. Go by and see them. Invite them to the service tonight. And uh, we'll have a good time. And they'll hear the gospel right here. Uh, Psalm 27 Let's look in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though wax should rise up against me, and this will I be confident. One thing I've desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. And in time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll bless the word of God as it goes out this morning. Speak to hearts. Challenge your people. And I pray for those who do not know that Jesus Christ is their Savior. That today would be the day of salvation. Lord bless in a great way. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we live in a fearful time. All around us, there's sickness. There's crime. Uh, there's political unrest, all kinds of things. Life is uncertain, but we have to realize that a lot of the things that we fear will never come to pass. I read a humorous story a lady walked by a wishing well one day, and there was a young lady standing by the well, and she was crying. And the lady says, can I help you? Is something to wrong? She said, no, I was just standing here thinking someday I might get married. Someday... I might have a daughter. Someday I might be coming by this well and my little girl would fall in the well and drown. And she was crying because of some someday that might happen. Listen, folks, we have to realize that God is in control. And, uh, you know, there's a serious time 
with this disease going around. But I want to go on record right now telling you there's a lot of exaggeration in what's happening. Uh, in Nashville, close to where we live, we get Nashville television. They interviewed a guy recently. He said, I signed up to take the test. Something came up, I had to leave. I never took the test, but I got a call on the phone. Hey, you tested positive. <laughs> Two ladies went to the health department. One of them had signed up to take the test, and again, time ran out, something happened, they left. They got notified they were positive. So. Uh, understand something, the pandemic is real, but it's exaggerated quite a bit from the state that it really is. I'm not saying being foolish, but I am saying if you're bound by fear and it keeps you from serving God and doing what's right, wake up. Because the Bible says God is in control. You know, I heard the story about Martin Luther. Martin Luther kind of started the Reformation. And, uh, but as he got older, he got discouraged. He would have bouts of depression. One week he was moping around the house, long face. And all of a sudden, his wife came in dressed in black. Now, nowadays, black is a fashionable color. But in the Middle Ages, black was the color of mourning. Luther looked at his wife. He said, who died? She said, God did. And Martin Luther said, foolish woman, God don't die, and she said, you have been acting like God was dead, and uh, it kind of shook him up out of the problem he was in, and uh, you know, first, the second Timothy 1, 7 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear but a power of love and a sound mind. I'm still looking for the sound mind, but uh, uh, the rest of it uh, I'm pretty well, well, pretty good with. But what this verse is saying is if you're afraid today, that fear did not come from God. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he, he gives us Power, I like that word power. It's, uh, in the original language, it's the word we get the word dynamite from. God gives us power, supernatural power to serve him. You know, some people are afraid to witness for Christ. They're afraid to serve him. And they're saying, I can't do it. Guess what? You can't. But with his power, you can't. You know, dynamite powerful. A few years ago, uh, we lived close enough to Nashville, like I said. We get the Nashville news on television. They were building the 840 bypass. And they were blasting with dynamite. A lady contacted the TV station. She said, when they were blasting out there, and she lived about 200 yards from where they were doing that, she said, rocks and debris were flying over and hitting my house. Why? Because dynamite is power. Well, look, when you have the Spirit of God living in you, Christian, he gives you power to live for him. 
And uh, we can have the confidence that we can serve God because of what he's done for us. But he also gives us power, love, and we need to love folks. Somebody said, people aren't impressed by what you know, but it's how you feel toward them. If we love people, we'll have a greater impact on their life. You know, I heard a preacher preaching on hell one time, and he acted like he was glad some folks were going there. No, that should not be our attitude, but we ought to care. Now, that's kind of my introduction. Psalm 27, it says that the Lord, first of all, is my light. Now, light gives illumination, gives direction. Have you ever been in a strange place? Barbara and I travel a lot. Sometimes we're in some place we're not familiar with, and we're old. We have to get up in the middle of the night. You, some of you older folks understand. Can't sleep the night through. And if it's dark, you got problems in this strange place. You might run over everything by trying to get to the important place. But it says, the Lord is our light. He helps us. You know, Psalm 119, 105 says, the Lord is my light. A light under my feet and a, a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. I'll get it right. But yeah, to give us direction in the way that we should go. And it's found there in the Word of God. It's the Word of God that gives us direction. That's why it's so important to spend time every day of the world in God's word. I heard of a person who set a rule, no Bible, no breakfast. And uh, that's not a bad rule. You know, to, to spend time in God's word to start the day. And that's important because he does guide us by his word. You know, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. You want to do the will of God, get into the word of God. So he is our light, but notice also, he is our salvation. Now, we live in a pluralistic society. People are trying to say, at least the world is, every religion leads to the same place. I want to tell you something, folks. That's a lie. That's a lie right out of hell because Jesus Christ said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, did you catch what Jesus Christ was saying? He didn't say, I'm a way to God. He said, I am the way and the only way to God. Peter preached in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Talking about the name of Jesus. And so, the most important single decision a person will ever make is what they do with Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of folks have been raised up in church. They've heard about Jesus all their life. And sometimes they think, well, I'm a child of God because I know all about Jesus. 
No, there has to be a crisis time where you realize I have sinned. I have broken God's commandments and God is a holy God and in my sin I cannot be accepted by him. But Jesus Christ paid in full the penalty for my sin when he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. Remember Jesus cried out from the cross. He said, it is finished. That means the plan of salvation was complete because he had paid the price. You know, we sing a song sometimes. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's Jesus Christ and him dying on the cross, shedding his blood to pay the penalty for our sin. And when we put our faith and trust in him, as I shared with the kids upstairs, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. So it's an act of faith of the heart when you receive Jesus Christ by faith into your life. What does the Bible promise? As many as receive them, John 1, 12, to them he gives the power to become the sons of God. So it's by faith in Jesus Christ. But notice, not only is he our salvation, but he, it also says we should have no fear. You know, when one of our kids was small, they were afraid of the dark. We taught them Isaiah 26, 3. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. You know what? It helped. You know, God told Joshua, fear not. Now, Joshua was going into an unknown situation. They were going in to take the land that God had promised to them. But notice, even though God said, it's yours, you can have it, they had to take it. And Joshua was going to be the general of the army. God told him, he said, fear not, for I am with thee. Now, I haven't counted them, but somebody said, there are 365 times the Bible says, fear not. And they said, that's one for every day of the year. And so we don't need to be afraid. Fear not. Why? Because the Lord is with you. Now look, folks. Fear can come into anybody's life. Even a spiritual giant like Elijah. Most of you remember the story. Elijah went on Mount Carmel. He rebuked the people and said, why are you straddling the fence? That's a Paul Rand paraphrase. He said, if God be God, serve him. And he told the false prophets, make an altar, Put your sacrifice on it. Call out to your God. If he answers, he'll be God. I'm going to pray to the Lord, and if he answers, God is God. And, of course, you know God gave a great victory that day. After Elijah prayed, the fire fell. The sacrifice, even the altar and the stones were burned up. A great victory for the cause of the Lord. But when Jezebel, the queen, heard what happened, she said, you tell Elijah 
He's going to be just like my false prophets. She didn't call them false. She called them her prophets, and they were false. And she says, Elijah's going to be like one of those when I get a hold of him. In other words, he's going to die. And the great prophet of God ran, hiding out, ends up in a cave. But the voice of the Lord came to him, and he said, what are you doing here? You see, champions for God don't need to be hiding. They need to be out ministering, working, serving. But here he was, hiding in the cave, and twice God asked him, what are you doing here? Now, there's a principle in the Word of God when something is repeated, pay attention. Now, all the Bible's important, but when it's repeated, there's an emphasis there. And God twice asked Elijah, what are you doing here? You need to be out. Go. And told him to go anoint some folks and uh, get busy. There's no time for us to hide. There's no time for us to to just kind of, well, it's too dangerous. I can't do anything for God. Yes, you can. Get busy and serve God. Don't let fear hinder you. Remember, the opposite of fear is faith. And the opposite of faith is fear. You remember the little story when there was a, the disciples were out in the boat. Jesus had stayed on the shore praying. But a storm came up. And he goes out walking to them on the water. Like the scared them to death. They thought it was a ghost. Or if you're from North Carolina, uh, they thought it was a hank. You know, so. But scared them. Jesus said, it's me. And remember what Peter said, Lord, if that's you, let me come to you on the water. And lo and behold, Peter actually steps out of the boat and he starts walking on the water. But he got his eyes off of Jesus. That's why the Bible says, Hebrews 3, looking unto Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Well, Peter got his eyes off of Jesus. He started looking at the storm and the waves and the results of the wind. He got scared and he started to sink. And he prayed the most theological prayer in all the Bible. Lord, save me. He didn't say, oh, my precious heavenly father, I come, no. Help! And that's the most theological prayer you can pray when you take all the fluff out and just tell God, I need him. You know, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, our church is having services, and they're live streaming. But folks, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. Uh, Why? Because there are some things in church we need. You can't get at home looking at a show. Remember Acts chapter 2? Peter preached the gospel. 3,000 people responded. And it said the next thing they did after they got saved, and by the way, if you're saved, you haven't been baptized, the next thing they did, they were baptized and added unto them. They became a member of the First Baptist Church in Jerusalem. But notice The next verse says that they 
continued in the pastor's doctrine and in fellowship. You can't get fellowship sitting at home watching a program. You need to be there. And it needs to be a part of our life. But they also it continued in the apostles' doctrine or the truth of the word of God. Now, God has a, a job for all of us. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourself. It's the gift of God. But verse 10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You're not saved by works, but when you get saved, you ought to work. It's like James says, faith without works is dead. So we need to be involved. We need to be serving God with all of our heart. Christian, are you serving him? Are you living for him? Is your life counting for him? If not today, it might be a good day to yield yourself anew and afresh and say like the Apostle Paul, Lord, what would you have me do? You remember Isaiah when Isaiah went into the temple and he had a vision of the glory of God, it showed him, first of all, his sin. And he said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. But he was cleansed. The angel brought up the coal and cleansed him. Then, after he was cleansed, when he got right with God, uh, we might use the word, he rededicated his life, maybe. Then the voice of God came to it. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah didn't say, use the preacher. He said, here am I, send me. And that's the kind of attitude that we need to have as believers. You know, the great, Independent Baptist churches were built on evangelism, soul winning, working for God. And if we're going to see great things happen, we need to get busy. Would you bow your heads with me? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder who might be here. And you say, Paul, I'm a Christian. But God has challenged my heart this morning. There's something I need to do. Pray for me. You just slip. I see hands already up. Thank you. How about over here? Uh, hands. Maybe you're here. And you say, Brother Paul, I don't even know for sure that I'm a child of God. But I want to know. Pray for me. I'll get my salvation settled. Anybody like that? You just lift your hand. Thank you. I see that hand. All right. Let's pray. Lord, folks have responded this morning. They said, Brother Paul, pray for me. I lift up my brothers and sisters that said, I've been challenged. I've been stirred. There's something I need to do for God. Help them, Lord, to do the right thing. And Lord, for those who would say, I don't know that Christ is my Savior. I pray that today they would say they need a Savior and respond to the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.
need heaven? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if you were to die right now, according to the Bible, where would you go? Isn't that wonderful? Then the obedience of the Lord's command, Hannah, and by all, all confession of faith in Christ Jesus. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very baptism. Yeah, there is still 